Hi, everyone, and welcome to track one, the 3 p.m. talk. Tonight, today we have our speaker is Amin Ra, and he is going to be speaking about how to hack your way out of home detention. Ladies and gentlemen, Amin Ra. Hey, can you guys all hear me? Yeah. Louder? Louder? Can you hear me now? Cool. Okay. So you all know where you are. You know what this talk is. Standard introduction slides. I am Amon Ra. Some of you know me. Most of you don't. Um, I work for a um, consultancy company doing pen testing. I should probably run over some disclaimers, but you're all big kids. What you do is your own responsibility. I legitimately own the system and don't just hack it. Blah, 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 academic use only. Don't be evil. On a more serious note, authorities are very upset when people tamper with home detention systems. If you do try and use this in the wild, you might be sent to jail for it. So I recommend only doing it in a lab. I'm sure we've all heard of home detention tracking systems. They're in the news, people are sentenced to this reasonably regularly. A couple of examples of sentences and crimes that have been sentenced to home detention are someone last year in LA was, sent to home, was sentenced to home detention for an immigration scam. More recently, someone hacked someone's email and got some home detention. So they tend to be non-violent, sort of relatively low risk crimes. If you're a murderer, you probably won't get home detention. How do these systems actually work? It's all very well to talk about them, but how do they operate? The goal is to restrict movement of a person who's been sentenced. So instead of being sent to jail, they will be given some amount of time where they're not allowed to leave their home. And this is quite attractive for uh, enforcement agencies because it's much cheaper. They have to pay for their own accommodation and food. It's a lot cheaper for the taxpayers. There's sort of two general categories of tracking systems. The older generation would have a bracelet or anklet that would transmit a signal to a physical uh, unit in the home that was not movable, and that would communicate with a monitoring station over a standard wired telephone network. Most of these systems are now considered legacy. All the new systems don't work like this. But because they're legacy systems, they're obviously still widely used. But all of the modern ones are phasing to a new type of system. That system uses GPS so that it can track you anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to be near your home. It uses a cell network, so it's not restricted to wired telephone lines. But it still may use a local beacon, which we'll look at later in the talk. Is this relevant here? The simple answer is yes. I haven't been able to find recent statistics, but an article I found from 2012 suggests that there are hundreds of thousands of people at any time on home detention. And we can see why that is, because it costs a lot of money to keep someone in prison. It's a lot cheaper for the government if they can monitor you within your own home. So obviously, I have a device. Now, how would you get one? I guess somewhat reasonably, the people who build and operate these systems are very reluctant to release any information. They're quite sensitive about it, so it's quite difficult to find information about them. If you Google for this, you're not likely to find much information. There is a simple way to get hold of one. Can you guess? <laughs> yeah. You could commit a minor crime, but I decided to go the more legitimate route. And so I found a company that builds these units in Taiwan. I managed to talk them into giving me a sample unit under the pretense that I was going to evaluate it for my company. Uh, I don't really care. I had to pay quite a bit of money, which if you have done business in Southeast Asia, you will know that there's a fine line between cost of products and bribery, but I have the system. It's all I care about. 
because I bought it from a manufacturer, they're obviously not going to tell me who their customer base is. And like I said, enforcement agencies are quite secretive about what technology they use. So I don't actually know where this unit is used. It could be you know, right here. It may not be anywhere in the States. Someone somewhere is using this vulnerable system because there's a market for it. I don't know who. Some of the vulnerabilities I'll be talking about are quite specific to the implementation of this system, and so they probably won't be relevant to other systems. Some of them are reasonably general uh, issues, and so they'll probably be relevant to other systems as well. Even once I got my hands on it, because it was a sample unit, it didn't come with documentation, so I wasn't able to operate it properly. I did a bunch of Googling and was quite lucky to find another system that uses the same code. Uh, it's used for tracking cars, and I got a manual for that, so I know how to use it. Obviously, because it's the same system, it's also vulnerable to the same flaws. How does this particular system operate? It uses GPS as one of the new systems. It also has a base unit which transmits a low frequency or lower frequency uh, beacon. And it has a large amount of tamper detection features which we will look at once we open the case. Um, battery life is around a week, but you can recharge it while it's on your ankle, so you don't have to have someone come and change the battery. Base unit also has a battery. It has, communicates in two different modes, both G, uh, SMS and GPRS. So you can either communicate with it with text messages or to a server on the internet through a socket. You can remotely reconfigure the device. So you can send it commands, change the settings, for example, change the position where the person has to remain remotely. You don't have to go and physically update the settings. So here I have the base unit. We won't spend a lot of time looking at this because there's not very much uh, in it, really. It's a pretty simple system. There's some tamper detection so that if you try and open up the case, uh, it'll send a message which will be relayed by the anklet to the authorities. But there's not a great deal of technology in there. Most of the interesting stuff is in the anklet itself. So this is like a close-up picture of what it is, but it's not that much of interest. The anklet, the bit that goes on your leg, is far more interesting. So this is what it looks like if we take off the strap. This is what the inside of it is. Some features that are interesting, we've got a reed switch. So there's a magnet in the... Uh, Strap, if you remove it, it can detect that and will send a warning, a tamper warning to the people monitoring it. Same thing with a push pin. If you remove the strap, there's a warning. There's an infrared LED and an infrared sensor. So this is also for tamper detection. How this works is there's a piece of fiber optic cable that runs around the band, around the strap. If you take bolt cutters and try and cut through it, that'll disrupt the infrared signal and the system will again send a an alert. Uh, other features is obviously where the battery is plugged in, there's a SIM card, and some kind of programming header. I don't really know whether I haven't tried reprogramming it. So when we actually open up like the circuitry so we can see exactly what's in it, we have an off-the-shelf uh, GSM cell network module that is, takes care of all of the network communications. We have a standard like, NAND flash memory chip, which is used for storing settings and storing locations when logging is turned on. There's a vibration motor, so you can automatically trigger alerts so that if someone moves into an area where they're not supposed to be or leaves an area, you can make the anklet vibrate so that the person is immediately warned they're somewhere they're not supposed to be. If we flip over the circuit board, We've got a standard um, Texas Instruments microprocessor. Um, it's just off the shelf. That'll take care of all of the sort of uh, processing on the system. I'm not sure if you noticed, but you will have seen this module on the base unit as well. There's no identifying information on it, so I don't know if it's custom built or if it's off the shelf, but it's obviously used for the uh, local low frequency radio transmissions. I don't know anything more about it than that. Uh, obviously, we have a GPS module um, that's pretty standard. 
So when this device is operating, there's a large range of different features and settings and stuff you can change. These are the most interesting ones, but it's not an exhaustive list. I won't go over them in detail, but you can change like the username and password or the coordinates where the user must remain and what happens when they tamper with it and all these sorts of features. Right, so that's enough for now about the security of this system. As we know, it communicates over the cell network, so in this case, GSM. GSM security has been investigated a lot by other people in the past. It's encrypted, so you can't just view traffic that's sent over the air. There's a secret key that's embedded in the SIM card that's used to authenticate the SIM card on a network. But it's a well known issue that the reverse is not true. A SIM card or a cell phone does not usually verify the authentication of the network. So this means it's possible to spoof a cell phone network. There's a temporary key which is used to encrypt traffic on the fly that's generated once the SIM card is authenticated. The SIM card does not know its own cell phone number. It has a unique ID which is then mapped within the telco to a number. This is relevant to what we'll be talking about. Um, I have a Blade RF. This is a software defined radio. I'm not going to go into details about it. Suffice to say that it allows me to receive and transmit within the cell network frequencies. Yeti BTS is an open source GSM stack. It allows high level scripting in JavaScript so you can easily change how the network operates. If you know, these are publicly available information, the network number and country number of a cell phone network, you can spoof that network. It's obviously illegal to do this, but from a technical point of view, it's not hard. Um, I have a DIY Faraday cage here. Two reasons for that. One is that I need to block some of the signal because my transmitter is not very powerful, so if I block some of the legitimate cell phone signals, it means the device is more likely to switch to my fake network. Another reason is that it's illegal to transmit in the cell phone network without a license, uh, and so I don't want to go to jail. As I said, there's two different modes that this anklet operates in. If it's in TCP mode, it uses a socket. Uh, you, it's not encrypted, so you can interfere with that, you can tamper with it. I haven't been able to do this because I haven't been able to get GPRS working on my uh, Blade RF, but there's nothing to stop you doing that. If it's in SMS mode, it's a lot more difficult, but as we'll see, it's still not impossible. So let's assume that we have a fake network and the device is now authenticated to it. When it sends a status update about where the person is, we can now see that message. So let's have a look at what the content of the status updates are. The username. So that's obviously what is sent when we're authenticating messages. So when you change settings, you send it a username and a pin. When it sends an update, it sends back the username. This is a major issue because now we can just capture the username and replay it. So we only need to get the pin before we have full control of the system. The next part of the message is a standard uh, GPS coordinate that's quite easy. The last part of that is a checksum, but it's not a signature, so we can recalculate the, uh, the checksum. We don't need a key for that. The final part of the message is, oh, appears to be custom. I haven't found any documentation about what it is. I can guess some of it or derive some of it, but we don't have to. So there's the message relayed from the base station. There's the charging status, those things are pretty certainly there. Things that it might include but I'm not 100% sure on are how much, battery how much battery is left, the message type and what the local cell towers are. Uh, it's possible to spoof the sender information from a text message. Normally when you receive a text it obviously has a sender number but I'm sure you've all received messages from a company name. That's because the Sender information is just a string. It's not forced to be a cell phone number. That's just enforced by the local network. But people have set up sort of fake 
cell phone networks in jurisdictions without much regulation. When they send a message to a local cell phone, they pass the message to the local carrier who has to trust the sender information. They have no way of verifying that. So they can send anything you want. You can use it to fake the sender number. They cost a small amount of money, but it's quite easy to do. I'm using SMS Gang, but there's a range of different providers. If you want to spoof a number, you have to know what number you want to spoof, which is a problem because, as I said, the SIM card only has a unique identifier, not the cell phone number. But it is possible to get the cell phone number. We could pull out the SIM card, place it in our phone we control, and send ourselves a text message that would obviously get them information. But if we open it, it's going to send a warning, right? So we can't do that. Well, a naive solution to that would be to wrap it in tin foil or aluminum foil and block out the signal so it can't send that temper detection. That doesn't work because the designers thought of this and if it can't send a message, it writes it to memory and retransmits it as soon as it can. The trouble is that it only uh, checks that it's been sent from the network. The network acknowledges, yes, message delivered. It doesn't do an end-to-end -end check. So if it's connected to a fake network, we can just say, yeah, your message delivered fine. You don't need to worry about it. And then it doesn't retransmit it. And we have it connected to a fake network. So we can do that. We can just pull out, put it in a fake network, pull out the SIM card, put it on our own phone, send ourselves a message, and we have the number. We could replace the SIM card and forward messages through our own phone, but if the authorities come and check the device, they're going to uh, know that it's been tampered with, so maybe not a good idea. Option number two, as I mentioned, because it transmits the username, we only have to get the PIN number before we can control the device. So we could possibly brute force it, maybe. The default PIN is just four zeros. If it's set by a human, it's probably not random. We might be able to dictionary attack that. Our problem is that because it's going to be on a fake network, any status updates that are sent will not be delivered. So we need to stop the fake network and tell it that the message was not delivered, stop the network, and then have it retransmit on the legitimate network, and then start up our fake network again. That's an option. If it's configured to transmit very frequently, this won't work because it's going to spend most of its time switching networks and very little time brute forcing the pin. But if it's transmitting reasonably infrequently, say once every 10 minutes, then we can spend most of the time brute forcing the pin. The advantage of this way is we're not just faking the messages. Once we have the pin number, we can take complete control of the device. Is it possible? So the pin must be four characters. It cannot be longer or shorter. It is only letters and numbers, no special characters. With these constraints, we have a bit over a million and a half possible pins. I've got not great hardware, so I haven't been able to get these speeds, but other people on the internet say it's possible to get around 30 messages a minute. That's just about 40 days, so that's a really long time. But you're sitting at home on home detention, so what else are you going to do? <laughs> okay, option number three. So. There's a tool called Kraken f and some rainbow tables for attacking GSM communication. A guy much smarter than me has done research on this um, and he released this tool. Basically, it allows you to capture GSM traffic off the air and in certain circumstances decrypt that to get the plain text. You can potentially forge messages and the cell network, will, cell network will believe it came from the device because it has the same key. You could forge a message to a phone you control and it will appear to come from that SIM so you can get the number that way. The downside to this is you can't intercept and block legitimate status updates which you can with the other two methods because it's not on your network. I haven't done this because I only have one uh, SDR, but I think it's probably possible to place the device with one SDR in a Faraday cage and have another SDR outside the cage and then decrypt the traffic on the fly as it flows through a laptop and therefore filter out messages that you want to block. 
although the key changes quite often, like every 10 minutes, so you'll need to sit there with the laptop. You won't be able to go elsewhere. If you can snoop an incoming message, so a message that is changing a setting, then you can get the pin number and have control of the device. But you're probably going to have to wait a long time because it won't be updated frequently. Okay, so you and the judge may have different definitions of Alcoholics Anonymous, but let's say he sentenced you to go to them. All right, so we're going to do a demo. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to assume we already have the number because that takes some time to get, so we don't have time for that in the demo. We're going to assume we got it from one of those methods. We have a Faraday cage and an SDR. We're going to spoof a cell network. We're then going to get the messages, the status messages that the device is sending, replace the location information, recalculate the checksum, re-encode the message, send it to a SMS spoofing service, and then we'll see that the message has been changed. Because it's encoded, it's a little difficult to obviously see that it's changed, so I've put together a Google map which will show us which points were received by my cell phone. In this case, it's pretending to be the monitoring station, the authorities, and which points were captured on the spoof network. Here's the map. So if we look at, I have the phone here. Here is the messages. It has three messages that I uh, sent earlier today. So I have a script which will check for messages on the phone and display them on a map. So these green points are messages that were delivered to the end system, the monitoring station in this case. We're going to start running Yatty BTS. So this is the uh, cell phone network, basically. And we have a script which will search through all the messages that it sees and then also display them on the map. They're going to be displayed in red. So because I've got this case open, it's going to beep because it thinks I'm tampering with it. So now we're going to place this in the Faraday cage with the uh, transmitter. And we'll run our network. So this may take a minute or so to start, but we should start seeing network information. Okay, so that's bringing up the radio. Uh, yeah, radio ready. So the network's all up and running. Now we just have to wait for the device to authenticate to it instead of the real network. So it can take a few minutes. Well, not a few minutes, but it's configured to send a status update around three times a minute. So we shouldn't have to wait too long. As you can see, it's just uh, information about the uh, low-level network events. So yeah, it's authenticated to the network, it's talking to the network. We should see here soon um, the content of one of the status updates. Uh, yep. So, oops. Well, I don't know if you saw that, but let's see if we can scroll up. Just here, this is the content of one of the messages it sent. So let's look at the map. So as you can see, we've got some red points. So the green points are what's showing up on the phone. The red points are faked. Now, we should see more of these. Let's see if we've got more points. Yep, we've got another point there. Let's just kill the screen. Thanks. Okay, so as we can see, <laughs> basically we're faking points. Now, normally what you'd want to do is fake points that meant you uh, or showed you being at home while really you were at the pub or somewhere. But in this case, we are not doing that. We're just going to fake them 
uh, that we're you know, next door because I can't leave and fake me being here. All right. Okay, so. No, thank you. What? <laughs> Sorry. I know. Who's? Who organizes this thing? Sorry, I'd rather not drink. All right, so the base unit. You don't get out of this. Yes, I do. <laughs> You're gonna force me to drink? No, that's what's the wrong with hacker cons. It's it's water. Death. Welcome to DEFCON. Thank you. Okay, so the base unit. Um why would it have this unit when it has a GPS locator? The reason is that GPS is quite expensive in terms of battery power and it's not particularly accurate indoors. So most of the time you're gonna be at home near a base unit. So it can save a lot of power by transmitting a local signal. When it detects a signal, it doesn't need to get a GPS fix. This transmits at around 434 megahertz. Um, it's using FSK, so you can see on the right hand side of the screen, that's an actual sample that I captured from this device. Uh, it transmits every 10 seconds. Is this interesting? It transmits a static message. It doesn't change. Well, it does change if you power on and off the device, but it doesn't change during operation. So you can just retransmit it. I don't know if it's unique to the device, but mm. yeah, record it, retransmit it. Um, yeah. So this has been kind of cool from an academic point of view, but let's look at how we could actually use this in the real world. Often, like I mentioned earlier, if you tamper with the system in operation by the police, they will probably be very upset and try and send you to jail. If you tamper with a system that's not yours, someone else may go to jail, they might come and get you in retaliation, so don't use it. Uh, so what you can do is, as I mentioned, it transmits a signal, a known signal, we can look for that, we can go out and war drive, but it's obviously not a very powerful signal, it's meant to only cover the range of someone's house, so you're going to need special equipment to find it. And it might be easier to just find out where someone lives by figuring out who's on home detention. If you do find them, you can easily jam all of the signals from this device. It's quite cheap to buy this equipment from China, uh, but it's obviously legal, so you wouldn't do that. You could maybe, like this is very maybe, I think it would be quite hard, but not necessarily impossible to perform the attacks we did remotely. So if you sat outside the house in a van, you might be able to do them, but I think it's gonna be pretty difficult. Can we make money from the system? That's the obvious question. To our advantage, if someone tampers with their system or breaks the terms of their home condition, they're usually sent to jail because the sentence of home detention is usually an alternative to a short time in jail. Could we blackmail the user? Maybe we can make it look like they're tampering with their system and get them sent to jail? Maybe, but I think it would be kind of difficult. A more viable option would be to build a device or a service which you just strap to your leg alongside the tracker and that performs these attacks automatically and lets them leave their home. Now that's actually sort of feasible. I haven't done this, obviously, because that would be really illegal. Our final option is maybe you'd be able to find someone who hates the person on home detention and get them to give you money to tamper with the system and get that person sent to jail. So, finally, 
there are issues with these systems. Like we like to think they're secure because they're part of the justice system, but they are not perfect by a long shot. Some of the things that I found with the system can be easily fixed. There's no reason not to fix these issues, like mutual authentication. So authenticate the like tracker and the monitoring station, not just one way. Into an encryption. People rely on the encryption of the cell network, but it's been well known for a long time that it's not very safe. So people shouldn't rely on that. They shouldn't retransmit the username. They should use better pins, that kind of thing. These are easily fixed. There's no excuse for that. Some stuff is very hard, nigh on impossible to fix with this design, and that's jamming of the system and finding out where the users are. It's basically impossible to fix them. Are there things in the future we could do with this? Yes. Given how poor the rest of the system is, it might be possible to get code exec or DOS or something through sending it malform packets. I don't know. I haven't tried that, but it would be cool to look at. The flash memory is a standard chip. There are tools out there that let you dump the code from that. You can potentially like, reverse engineer it and look for bugs or backdoors in the system. It will be not difficult to write a Android simulator that you can pull out the SIM card, put in your phone, and that will pretend to be the anklet. Um, you can also spoof the GPS location, and that will cause it to think it's in a different location. Actually, someone's talking about that right now in a different room. Why are you here? There's a better talk happening. Um, questions? I don't know how much time we have. Does someone? Yeah, do you, do you have any questions? Yes. So this particular unit or home detention systems in general? It was just a friend of mine said, hey, I wonder how secure these systems are. And I was like, hey, that'd be a cool project. So I brought one. Anything else? Sorry? No, he, it's all of my work. He just said it in passing, and I spent $1,000 on hardware to get it. Yeah? I don't know for sure. When I was searching for manufacturers, I found a half dozen different manufacturers, each with a few different models of trackers. So I'd estimate it on the order of a few dozen, but I don't think there's that many. Anybody else? Yeah? No, like I said, people are very uh, cagey about information with these systems. No one will tell me who their customers are or and jurisdictions won't tell me which system they use, so I really have not been able to find out where things are used. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, so the question is if we can replay the signal from the base station, why don't we do that? It's a lot easier, right, than trying to attack the cell network communications. The reason is that it's only sometimes use useful. So, the device can be configured to always check the GPS location, or it can be configured to only check when it's not in the home, and you don't really know without testing it, whether it's in one of those two modes. So if it is, then it's definitely the easier attack, but you don't really know that. Yeah, anybody else? No? Oh, yes? So you're asking, is anyone like interested in building better systems? Oh, no. Um, as far as I mean, no. Um, none of the manufacturers or anyone have talked to me about it, so no, I don't really care. That's their problem. 
Yeah. So the IR tamper detection device. Sorry. Yeah. So it's just an infrared LED, as far as I know, and it transmits a signal of some kind. There's a emitter and a detector that is fed through a piece of fiber optic that runs around the band. If you cut the fiber optic, the light is going to be disrupted and you won't, you know, it won't reach the receiver and so then it will send a, an alert. So that's how the IR tamp detection works. Yep, is, yeah? Yeah, so possibly, like that's beyond my skill level. I couldn't do that, but there are definitely people who are able to tamper with and tap into fiber optic cables, and so yeah, I think that's plausible. Yep. Uh, yeah, is that everybody? Yep. Uh, in the UK, Team Arrest uh, had its uh, account with the government to supply these endangered after the emergence that they uh, put one on some sort of Yes, I did read about that. Um, I know 4GS is used in a number of countries. This is not one of their devices, but yeah, I wanted to try and get their device, but I couldn't get them to give me one. Uh, yeah, is that everybody? Cool. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs>